Erica, do you want to start? Or not Erica? <laughs> Chris, do you want to start? Hi, Christy with Mac Advantage. Todd, Seven Spring Solutions. Sanjeev with Gearbox Solution. Sean, 360 Works. Nick, 360 Works. Julia, 360 Works. Junior, 360 Works. I'm David Nadel with Blue Feather. And I'm Michael Lane with Gearbox. And Michael is going to be our presenter today. Yes. And I will um, get going. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to open up um, a slide and we'll get started. So um, that's just the first slide that I'm going to skip through because we discovered that. And then I'm going to tell my story in 92 slides. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, Short version. So we are going to talk about three things and really. I could do a session on just one of these and I could do 10 sessions on one of them because they're so, but I, I chose all three because um, we took on a project last year that was a pretty large scale project and we wanted to see what we could do to, what we could try out to see how effective it was and, and, um, and also to, to learn from. So at a high level, we took on three we took on three challenges when, when taking on this project with this client. We chose to do an MVC design pattern, party model, and transactions. And I'm just going to, at a high level, I'm just going to talk about all three, one at a time, and, and show you how they came together in the solution, what worked, what didn't work. We've done a post-mortem in December. We're still doing work on this project. We just, we finished with phase one. So first of all, MVC. Um, anyone familiar with model view controller for many okay and it, are you familiar with that from filemaker or from non-filemaker non-filemaker that's right um party model we'll get into um and transactions let me just stick with this slide for a minute so um mvc for those who don't know it's a software design pattern consisting of data presentation and a controller to control information it's very common in um, in other languages and platforms the party model that we're going to talk about is a particular type of data model that we implemented in this solution. And then lastly, I think probably the thing that most FileMaker developers are familiar with are, is the concept of a, of a transaction um, of a transaction and how you, how you store records. So we'll get, we'll get to that later as well. So, um, so this is in the context of a project with a client. So the journey was, it was a one year project. Um, we had a legacy FileMaker solution that was 21 years old. Um, the system, the, the division of the company that we did this for has over 200 users across 10 offices in the U.S. They're all spread out. And then um, they also do a significant amount of international travel, which means that we had to take that into consideration when they're connecting to the system. Uh, the goal was process improvement improvement to the user experience. It was, it was just like you'd imagine an old FileMaker solution to be with someone who just sort of taught themselves. Um, user satisfaction, they actually had people, you know, leave their jobs because they just couldn't get their jobs done in a timely manner. Um, a lot of crashes, a lot of problems with um, the user experience. And then um, they really needed to integrate with other platforms. Specifically, they use an enterprise shipping platform that a lot of global shippers use, and um, they, couldn't, they couldn't interface with it. So we did a lot of integration with APIs. And then lastly, um, they just wanted a, something that they could build on for the future. The other thing was sort of a lot of different pieces kind of crumbling together. Uh, I, I, when we um, when we trained their users, we went through and just explained the differences between the two systems. And I thought it would be helpful to give you all some context from where they started, where we went, and why we used implemented these try to implement these three things. So the differences, I'm just going to briefly bring these up. But these are the things that we communicated to them that were um, major differences between their current system and their new system. Um, this was also um, a little bit interesting. So the green is their current system, and this just shows you when we rebuilt the system, they had, we at least matched parity with the functionality, and then 
On top of that, a lot more functionality, but we did it with far fewer relationships, far fewer scripts, fewer value lists, fewer everything. It's a much, it's a much smaller world. Um, so that just gives an idea of where they were and where they are now. More robust. Yeah. And then, um, and then another good visual is that their current system was 29 files, just cobbled together over time. Mm -hmm. um, the average user had six windows open at once. They all looked different. One looked like it was from FileMaker 7, one looked like it was from FileMaker 10, one looked like it was from FileMaker 14. Different sizes and they you know, had trouble moving around. So we basically went to a one window system with a few exceptions. Um, and then ArtWise, which is the name of this um, application, has those three little icons represent MVC. The first one is the user interface, an API file or controller file, and the database. So far so good? Okay. Um, we also struggled with some um, networking differences that will play into kind of what worked and what didn't work when we get into the meat of, of this discussion. So in their current system, their old system, everyone used remote desktop over WAN. Everyone logged into their headquarters in New York and then, um, and then they connected directly. That remote desktop, um, for those of you who may not be aware, there are a lot of problems with that. You can't, you can't drag and drop, you can't save a file to your desktop. They had this funky mechanism where they would open up something and click a button, it would email them a report or a PDF or a document that they needed to get to a client and it would show up five minutes later in their email and it was pretty convoluted. We had a client that was doing something similar to that too. They were on like some server that had 56 gigs of RAM or something like that and all kinds of weird licensing for all yeah. the users being on the same machine at once. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. I know, I, I know dot 22 is the IP address of that of that Citrix server, that Windows server, because you know everyone came in on that twenty. Paying something like three thousand dollars a month <clears throat> just for the server for these things. It's expensive to have everyone, yeah. already, or it's more than three thousand. They to have everyone already paying in like that. Yeah. They they that company probably wastes an awful lot of money on their IT stuff. They just I don't think they have a lot of people that know what's going on. So the current architecture, they wanted to get rid of all those constraints, um, and so the current architecture is is the FileMaker client that connects over WAN to um, an Azure server on the East Coast. And that, that became pretty important because um, some things, once you're VPN'd in and you're, you're logged into that LAN network, things are pretty zippy, depending on what you're doing. Plus, it's a super old system that didn't have a lot of complicated relationships or searches. And then we did a lot of cool, fancy, hard stuff that ended up <laughs> becoming really important to get right over WAN because we had a lot of performance problems, which I'm going to get into later. But I thought it was good to show you this because this is why we um, had so many problems that we ended up having to pause and figure out and rework. So, okay, so now MVC, just as a high level overview, um, MVC stands for Model View Controller. It is a very common way to write software applications. Um, what I have here are some, some of the mo more common languages, and underneath are some of, the, uh, some of the frameworks that are MVC frameworks for those languages. Does, any, does anyone use any of these besides, what, what, what do you use? React yeah. and Node. React and Node. Yeah, Laravel View. and Zen. Laravel, Zen, great. Um, Rails is, a, a, even though I, no one here uses Rails, I'm sure everyone knows it, it's, it's a, it's a hugely popular framework for the Ruby language. And then there's Django for Python. So part of my approach to this is, I mean, I'm, I have one foot in FileMaker and one foot firmly not in FileMaker. And I grew up doing, you know, Cake and Code Igniter stuff and Laravel and PHP. So MVC, um, you know, was a common thing for me. And I've also gotten into Vue a lot more in the last um, year or so. But it doesn't translate perfectly into FileMaker. So, um, but we tried to make it work, and and I'll, I'll explain a little bit of that. So, so MVC, the um, these are the three components. So the model, you think um, when you think about the model, that's really the data. The view, when you think in terms of a browser-based solution, the view is the HTML that gets rendered, the output sent to the browser from the controller. 
And the controller, I sometimes describe it as the brains. It listens for a request and it puts it all together by making it might call a few methods in the model to get data and then spit it back out. So, um, so this is just a high level what MVC means. But in the FileMaker world, this is, this is how it translates. And what I think is pretty easy for a lot of FileMaker developers to get to is they probably recognize that this is, those two components are the separation model, which I personally never got on that um, kick when I started doing FileMaker and when I realized that um, I was gonna be doing FileMaker for a while. I knew what the separation model was, but it was never anything. I just, I just never had a need for it. I never went down that road, although I know a lot of people have had great success with it. So the separation model for me has always been something that I just let lie until I started to learn about what the folks at Proof Group do in their solutions and also Todd Geist. Um, they have a, an open source FileMaker framework called Carbon, Carbon with a K. Is in, who, who here knows about Carbon? Nope. Okay, so I think it was released, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. Um, how many people use separation model? Sure. How many people use the separation model on a regular basis? How many people know what it is? Okay, great. Um, so does, does it make sense that the interface file and the data file, that's the separation model? All right. So big influencers uh, are Todd Geist and, um, and Proof Group, two big um, filemaker shops here in the States. Um, and and I, I mentioned Proof Group, and I'll talk a little bit more about them, but um, Ernest Coe and Corn Walker, those guys, are, those guys are super smart, and they do a lot of um, stuff in the education space. And they have very large systems that they have designed for um, schools. And they use the party model extensively. And I've learned a lot by watching some videos and having conversations with those guys. And I've got some resources in the back, some links to some videos that are super informative. Um, and again, I'll just mention that Carbon is on GitHub. You can download it. It's free, it's open source. I think they just did an update in the last um, few weeks, but it hadn't been updated for at least um, several months. But it's got all the things in it that, that support this concept of model view controller. They, and um, they've got a contacts database. It pretty, I cribbed a bunch of stuff from there. And when we get to transactions, transactions came, 90% of what I did in transactions comes directly from Carbon. They even have a file that you can feed data to and it will spit out a script that will take parameters in JSON and write a bunch of records for you. It's really, it's really cool. Um, it's not something that you, you know, look at for an hour and get it. It takes a while. So let's get it, let, let's uh, look at a, some MVC stuff and, and show you what I did here. This is just telling me that this is not a production version. So this is um, this is the solution we did called Artwise. You'll notice I've got um, these files are normally they're never open, so I make a lot of calls to them, but they're never open, so I never actually never have to go to layouts or anything like that. But I'm going to go ahead and open them just to show you that um, these uh, three different files that we use. Um, the interface file is the only thing that, um, that, that the user will log into and use. And if I look at the, so the user interface file has two data sources. One is the API file and one is the data file. I, I called it an API file because we actually use it as an API file for some web things going on. But it's really the controller in the MVC pattern. Um, some people would call that a controller and I know that other people might call it an API file. But it's really just something that we throw 
throw data at, and then we get stuff back. And then um, just to be thorough, if we look at the API file, it's got it's got one reference to the data file, no reference to the UI file, and of course the data file you can imagine has um, what is that? Oh, <laughs> that is that is a. Uh, Something left over for me, I think, um, doing some migration stuff, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't need a, it wouldn't have a reference to anything else. So this file doesn't know anything about the API file or the UI file. Um, so let's see an example of MVC. When I, when I'm in the UI file, if I want to do something like get a party, one of the one of the reasons for using MVC in this case to have this intermediary API file is because I have one place that has all my logic. There's not a lot of logic in the UI file. It just collects data to store records or it collects information to search for records. I throw it to the API file and the API file looks at the data file, gets it and throws it back. So I'm going to skip around here for a minute, but I'm going to open a shipment and I'm going to cheat and go to a layout that I'm going to show you show you how I did something in an older way so. all right so um, I'm gonna go to some other record here so I, I want to add a shipper to this shipment so when I click this plus sign that popover shows up. And when I say met, I type the met in and um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's metro. Yeah. You can see what's happening here. I'm typing in something, some scripts are happening. I'm running and I'm getting data and I'm throwing it. I'm throwing some IDs back to a global and it's populating a portal on a popover. Everyone, right? We're all, we all know what's going on. Virtual list. So I'm, um, it's not even a, yeah, yeah, it is a virtual list, yeah. It's, yeah, it's just using a, a row thing and it's got, it's virtual list technique for sure. So I'm, I'm gonna jump around because I just showed you this technique and one of the things that happens is we, every time I type in there and do something, it runs a script called, it runs a script um, called, I think get parties. Get party. Nope. It searches something. I'm going to open the API file and I'm going to look at. Um, so, what this is, is the transactions of the API file. So, can everyone see in here? I, I um, one of the benefits of this is that it logs everything every user does. It's great for troubleshooting. It's great for trying to figure out what's going wrong. And while you're developing, it's fantastic to see, to, to, the system will actually tell you what you're doing wrong or tell you why something's not happening. So this, what you see is almost exactly carbon copy of what's in carbon. In the carbon controller file, you're gonna see something that looks very much like this. I have way more um, entities and way more fields because this, got blown out for the solution, but it's basically the same thing. So I've got some, so I set some fields here, but basically let me just stick with this concept of, see this get parties? I ran a script from the UI file called get parties and I passed it these parameters. I have these switches, all this logic happens in the UI file. But in this case, the only thing that was that, uh, in this case, remember I was searching for an organization. So is organization is true? I was, I want to return the max records of 30 and here's the query string is the met. And you'll notice over here, I got, um, my result is JSON. It's, I got the count and I have I think something called an ID list. And you'll notice somewhere in here, you're going to see some character. Yeah, it's right there. So it's really just a list of IDs that I get back. And of course I parse it in the UI file. I stick it in the global and that's what drives that, that portal. So, just on a, 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 kind of a technical question on mm -hmm. this, this yeah. is returning JSON 
For the ID list, why is that a delimited list like that and not a, like a JSON array? Because I am, because it's easier to get back. Um, it's easy to do this. Let me see that ID list. Mm -hmm. Let me show you. Is this for virtual list parsing purposes? No, uh, it's actually, it's because it uses list of. Mm -hmm. So there's a field called ID list and it's list of just the IDs that I get back. Mm -hmm. So it's just a simple way of doing it. I don't know if, uh, I know what you mean, but when I, um, so I, that's what I would have done, but in carbon, they use this list of uh, function a lot. And I thought, okay, well, Todd Geist is using it. I guess, I guess I'll use it too. <laughs> so, so that's what it is. So most tables have an ID list field. I'm, um, and it returns a list of, which, and instead of doing something fancier, I just get that back and then, and then but the thing is, it's really easy to parse through return to limited uh, values. So that's what I'm doing, yeah. I, there's there's a fair amount of complexity with JSON and there's arrays and nested stuff and objects, but in this case, it's that's why. Um, that is why. So, so the good news is, we um, we have this script. We have a get party script. The get party script is used all over the system, and there are seven different scripts in the UI file that call the get parties script. But there's only one get party script. So. It's this, um, it's this source of truth thing. There's only one way to get a list of parties. And if I want to add functionality to it, for example, when I first wrote this script, um, it was before we were using, before we were looking for field ops, which is a type of role in this system. It was before we were looking for agents. So I had this thing called get parties and I would pass it a few flags and I'd get my results back. Well now, there are all these other switches I added over time, but I only ever had to do it in one place. Make sense? And, and then let's go ahead and jump in and just look at that script really quickly. Um, most transactions in this particular MVC solution, um, you, 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 you set some keys in the transactions table, and then it drives creating relationships or finding things. Uh, but when it comes to find, normally what Carbon does and what I've done for performance reasons is I just go to layouts and use native finds. So let's, we're going to walk through this script and we won't have to later, but I'll reference it. Um, so the first thing we do is I get my JSON. I evaluate whether it's valid. If it's not, I exit the script. Then I parse them. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. This is something that someone at Salient came up with a few years ago. I've, I wrote an article on, on the history of passing parameters in FileMaker, and this is kind of the latest, greatest way to do it, in my opinion. So it uses JSON, but you just call that, and it spits them all out as, as, a, as, as local variables. So we start a single pass loop. Um, if anyone wants to talk about that, the pros and cons, I'm, Free for that, but I, I use them all the time now. I love them. Um, and then we run a script that I didn't write. I just use it. I don't even care how it works, although I kind of know how it works. It starts a transaction, and that's something that he does with, it has to do with committing the record and, and um, storing things for transactional purposes. So I enter find mode. I go to a layout that's set up for this particular find, and then I have a field called searchable data that I write to a bunch of cache stuff. So if I'm querying the Met, if I if the Met's in New York, I also write the city of that there, and I might write the Met, New York, and maybe some other keyword. So if someone types New York, they're gonna they're gonna find results just like if they type the Met. That's they're both are gonna show up in the same way. So then here are the flags that I switch, and you all I mean this is just a simple font maker find, but I'm just sort of walking you through it from the UI file to the data I pass to the API file um, and the results I get back. So if I, do, if I don't have any results, um, that's it. If I do, this is where I work out that I just want to return a maximum of 30 records. Then um, I go back to the transactions layout and, um, and we 
and we exit we exit with with this JSON here that that um, that you asked about. There's that see that list. Mm. Yeah, ID list. Then I list the list of. So do you, you have, um, I'm sorry, do you have any criteria of um, how it's returning the 30 records? Is it by created date and time, or is, is there any kind of a sort? That no, there's not. There's so it not. Would just be creation order. Right? I guess so. Yeah, it would just be the. I mean, if if you type the, it's going to be you know it's going to return tons of records. But you're right. There's no sort based on it. I just want to. The thing, the fact is that we know that whatever they type, there's going to be something that, that um, that's going to. Be, it's thirty is a good good number of records to return and not do more. Right. Um, if we had to adjust that, we could. But you know what? I think we landed on thirty, and we and we never we never needed to change that. But that's no, a good I don't mean point. for the count, but for the no, I know this, which ones yeah. represent like yeah. more current records versus older records. Yeah, maybe. no, I mean something like this. You know, the Met. There's gonna. If, if they're looking for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, just get they the type the and Met and more information. Yeah, yeah. If they have a bunch of yeah, as a matter of fact, that touches on something else. Um, <clears throat> one of the problems with the approach that I just did was, um, so you see this get parties. Let me go back. Here's another get parties that I ran in a keystroke, and then I did this get parties. I ran, and then that was maybe the first one I did. So one, one two, three, four, five. Um, I ran six calls to that API, right? So six different calls went. That's six calls to the API file. That's six transactions to record. And that's six times opening the transaction, running the function, closing the transaction, committing the records. And I'm going to jump way ahead. but. This was one tremendous problem that we found with using this was um, performance. So we, we tested in Atlanta, we tested on WAN, we had an AWS server set up and everything was just fine. And even in their New York office, everything was fine. Their LA office, they would type and it took a really long time. Performance was horrible. Um, and what we found was that when, the, when it runs that transaction process, every time you commit a record, I mean, I don't, is this something I just never really realized that over WAN with FileMaker's inherent latency, when you commit, it just, you know, commit, committing a record takes a second for FileMaker. Well, committing a record over and over every time you hit this from California to Virginia with FileMaker's latency, and it turns out with, with their not great bandwidth in their LA office, you had 10 people standing around pulling their hair out because it would take 40 seconds to get a result back. So while this was super elegant, we thought it was so awesome, we, we basically threw it out uh, about a month before we went live. And I'm gonna jump to the solution that ended up working. Before you get yeah. to that, so what are the transactions doing here? Because it looks like it's doing a fine um, in this so, case, we're doing a find. Okay. In this case, we're doing a find. Um, I will show you another transaction where it doesn't do a find, and it'll be show you more proper what the transaction is supposed to do. So I'm going to go ahead and, and add this. I'm going to um, I'm going to move this down here for a second, and I'm going to go back here. Yep. Let me go to let me go to yet another. That's one record I don't want to mess with. But okay, so. So I'm going to answer um, both questions. First, I'm going to I'm going to show you what a transaction does when we actually write a bunch of records to the system. But um, notice I went to that old layout, and the layout had a name popovers. That particular layout had popovers all over the place. So we were using that paradigm of opening up a popover, typing, doing all that stuff. We did that, but you have to do it for a shipper, an agent, a consignee, a field ops person. Um, one or more truckers, couriers. So there are all these fines that were going on and I had all these popovers. Um, some, some I was able to use for the same ones, but there were enough differences between the different types of entities that we were searching on that we had to have unique popovers because we showed different results. All that was really slow. So what we ended up doing was we, 
we went to a little more native FileMaker, but we used something we used something that's new was new in 17, which is a card window. So now, every time you want to search to add an entity to a shipment, we open a card window. It opens super fast. That's the first thing. There's no animation, which you can turn on or off, but we have even found out that animation from LA, when we had animation on for those, you know, that elegant little, that, that, that was, when we turned it, it off, it was better. The portal and all the records, yeah. even if they're empty. For that, yeah. yeah. So we went to this card window, which we use all over the place. So if I type the met here, whoops, we get super fast um, results, but this is a quick find and a list view. So we switched a number of solutions to the same thing when we have virtual lists with the popovers to yeah. card window searches. It is much faster. Right. It's and much faster. Easier. It's much it's faster. Easier to program too, you know? <laughs> yeah. And when I go back to the transactions, see these are all the transactions I've run since then? None. Zero. So um, I'm going to go back and choose the net. So I choose the met. Once I choose the met, we go to another card window, and I still don't think I ran a transaction, did I? Yeah, still didn't run a transaction. I get the met, and then what I do is I land on a, on a table with a different context, um, and this is searching through all the people because I need to, um, the next step here is if they had more than one address, we would land on an address card, and they'd pick their address. And then the next step is we pick the person that's going to be the attention to or the um, individual responsible for the shipment. So I'm just going to choose any one of these, or I could say create without attention. So I click there. <clears throat> so notice we have all this population. Now, when I go to the transactions, you're going to see a transaction here called set organization shipment role and it's v2 v2 means that we're not doing stuff the way we did when we first designed this v2 is faster v2 is sort of more filemaker native <clears throat> um, so this is an example hopefully this will answer your question so this is an example of um we are uh, this is also something the first version we did of this when we did a transaction we wrote a bunch of data. We did a bunch of transactions and sub-transactions, and that commit took a really long time. And so now, this transaction, it's really just logging that something occurred. And we do get a result back, but it's not nearly as um, heavy as it was doing it the way Carbon does it. Now, I guess at some point, I'd love to have a discussion about the performance of what they built for this thing over WAN when you've got a bunch of, when, you, when you're creating a bunch of other records at the same time. But in this case, um, we set these, uh, does anyone have any questions about, I mean, do you know what you're looking at? We're, we basically have a bunch of IDs that we need to set. And then this, we, we write this record, that's the, those are the parameters we set. And I can look at, you wanna look at that script? Setting fields, yeah. uh, like I said, field by name. Yeah, it's yeah. It, 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 this may not even do that. So, let's see, this is. So this is the script that we. This is the script we just ran. So we start our transaction. Yeah. Okay. I'm a, after we look at this, I'm going to show you the original one. So notice how here I go, um, I actually go and load, um, I, I, I say I, I create a new record. I set, an I set some activity role information. That's a whole other thing about the party model. Um, I just evaluate these things and set, this is setting the activity of that organization. And then if they have, if they did choose someone for the attention, then I set a new request for an activity role for that individual, not the company, but the person. Then I, um, I get the address ID 
and we what we do is we we um, duplicate an address record because that record we take the address record from the Met, but they could they might change it to a warehouse, they might change something about it. So that address becomes just a contextual address that's tied to the shipment and not to the organization. Then um, this is where I set that stuff. So I see there's like a find in the middle of this. Is this all still being done as a transaction? No, it's not. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I, th but but this is like three times faster than the transaction yeah. way. <clears throat> so all this is sort of native FileMaker. I go to a layout, I do stuff. I go to another layout, I do stuff. All behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. This version is the transaction way. So I go in and we we set um, we set a transaction uh, we set I we set values in the transactions table itself. So what happens is we start a new record. I go through and I set uh, the party, the shipment, uh, the role, and the create mode is um, this is for things that happen later on. And then I'm, I see whether or not this shipper is already assigned to this. So we actually do some validation here. Then I'm setting fields. I set a shipment field. And when all this gets set, I'm, I'm, I'm just setting related records that is gonna, that's the whole transaction part of it. So this is the transaction piece. It's really cool and it's really elegant, but it turned out that it just, the performance wasn't great over WAM. Um, so what we did was, when we, f we went through and we figured out all the things that took a long time. And those things, we ended up doing what you saw in the V2 of, of the shipment. We, we did it all native. If it's, a, if it's a small transaction, we left it alone. But if it was something that caused a delay, we rewrote it. Um, this is more of just setting all these fields. There's a ton of information that gets set because all these data points actually get pushed to this enterprise system. So there's a lot of work here that you know, I wouldn't drag you through the details of. But in the end, we, um, we, uh, that's the, that's, so that's, that's, that's how the transactions work. Let me, let me show you this. You, this might either bring about some questions or, um, so this is the relationship graph for transactions. Mm -hmm. So we've got a transactions, which is basically your, it's just a table with a bunch of keys in it. And then depending on what you wanna do, if you wanna create a party record or some record hang off the party record, we, um, we set these, uh, we set this and then we al allow creation. That's on most of the time. So this is what allows you to either create or update a record by setting the IDs. It's very much like selector connector. It, yeah, it is. Um, it is. Can, can, can we talk about selector connector for a second? Is everyone familiar with selector connector? Do people, um, who, who uses it today? Often, all the, some, all the time, some of the time, none of the time? Usually for like a workflow where you have to like create a bunch of records and you want the ability to to undo that, you know. yeah. Have you um, come across any performance problems with it? Typically work on small databases. Okay. Mm -hmm. no. I so, have seen, so we used to use it more and <clears throat> particularly before card windows were around and it allowed you to do a lot of stuff without having to leave a layout and cause flashing on the screen, which mm -hmm. people really liked. Yep. <clears throat> um, but we, started seeing some performance things with larger solutions where you have everything related to everything and uh, yeah, FileMaker doesn't like that as much. <coughs> it pulls right. up everything that's connected all the time. Exactly. Through the, you know, and yeah. it doesn't need to. Yeah. In this case, it doesn't really matter because you've only got one selector to the other tables. So in this case, it is like selector connector mm -hmm. and, um, and you, you can draw a lot of parallels, but, 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 um, this is, it doesn't cause a problem here. Uh, it's mostly the commits. Mm -hmm. um, but I will tell you that in the UI file, and I'm gonna close that in the UI file, this solution started with, um, with selector connector. 
And this is the relationship graph today. Uh, I don't know if I should zoom in or zoom out. Let me do this first, give you guys an idea of. So that's almost it. So uh, does, that, does that look like a lot of stuff or does it look like not much? <laughs> Hard to tell, okay. Um, so we've got this anchor buoy going on, but just so you know, if I go down here, you see this, uh, see this? Mm -hmm. Haven't been able to break it yet. Well, it's, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's not in use. None of it's in use. But um, that used to be, that used to sit over to the left and everything was connected in the system. And we realized that that was another performance problem that we found, especially with LA and San Francisco. Um, what wasn't a big deal in New York, but it was a huge deal across the country. And so we made the decision, you know what, let's, I mean, we heard that there were problems, but we had never experienced performance problems with select or connector until this. I know other people have. How many of you know who Hansa is, uh, the guy from 2 for you from, Czech, from the Czech Republic? So he's a, he's, a, um, he's a guy that's been around for a really long time. They have a pretty successful file maker shop over there. He's got like 20 something employees. He's always at DevCon, they've always got a booth. He's a very smart guy and he did a presentation recently, I think at a mm -hmm. European developer conference. And um, it was all about performance. And part of his, part of his uh, presentation was about Selector Connector. And he talked about all these bottlenecks and um, Selector Connector brought down the performance of his solution by something like 70%. It was, wow. it was huge. And I watched that video as I almost had finished breaking off this. And, 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 I, when I, and I've got a reference to that video in here as well. So for us, that was another huge takeaway was selector connector. If it's a small solution and it's maybe you know, a, on LAN or it's not a big deal, there are a lot of small benefits, but it really hurt us here. So this is all stripped out. So nothing is tied to those. And um, performance went way up, especially the further the way the word you were, the more you could measure it. So as much as I enjoyed making all that stuff, I had to break it apart. Um, and I'll tell you another, another little fact that was really helpful to me is since we were so close to going live, we didn't have an opportunity to kind of redo everything from scratch. I had lots and lots of dependencies on Selector Connector. So what I did was Everything I, I couldn't I couldn't just rip it all out. I had to I had to leave it, but I had to leave it in such a way there where I got rid of everything being connected, everything else. So you see here I have connector, I have selector, I have fine, which is just um, we just sort of abstracted everything that we used for fines all over the place. Um, and then you see find out birthdays, find out person, find out this, find out that. So you'll notice over here every major Sorry, this is hard to see. Every major, um, what I really want to do is, here we go. I'll just, let's see, let me use shipments. Here we go. So this, see this estimate piece right here? I'm trying to zoom in so that it's really easy to see. So, so estimates, of course, was bound to selector connector, just like everything else was. And I was using it, and I couldn't just rip it apart. So you'll notice that, I, so what we do is um, we'll have a base table, and then everything off of that, we just use a kind of a three-letter indicator. So s.project, estimate, est, estimate, dot, estimate caveat. And what I did was I made the base table dot find the base table dot selector. So these are copies of what was tied to selector connector, but it's not tied to anything else. So I just have sort of a, a mirror or a ghost of selector connector. I have, I have the same model without the, without the same problems. 
And that was, that was a, it, I think it's, so if someone does have a selector connector and you, your solution is getting larger or you're finding performance problems, you can still use it. You just have to do something like this. Does that make sense? You see what I did about how I, I'm still, I'm still using, I was able to use the same widgets, but I just had to change the context. So that now this is, this is tied to selector, but it's only tied to one selector. It's, this selector is not tied to everything else. Does that make sense? Yeah, one of the things we really like when, when you know, selector connector was first new is uh, having connected to like a preferences yeah. TL. And it was just like, oh great, everything's connected to preferences. Everything you can just connected. read those preferences I from mean, anywhere. I, I, in 2014, I did a presentation at a pause on selector connector. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. And then, but, yeah, okay. but moving like this, you just, you know, you just have to make your own little preferences off of each anchor. Yeah. And you still have that same functionality there. Right. It's just as easy to get to. Right. So I've, um, I've probably spent a lot of time on this, and I'm going to try to move quickly and get through a couple of other uh, things. Um, so lessons from that, I guess, summarizing all that. Yeah. There's a lot of fancy stuff, and it ended up being... Well, I mean, we, we, obviously, we're still using a ton of it, but there are certain things that we just, we just uh, got away from. We got away from selector connector. Transactions, we find that some of the transactions that did a lot of work was it was just too much of a burden performance wise so we ended up having to pivot and use native filemaker stuff which turned out to be faster you think but, moving that to a perform script on server might have that's a good been an alternative. <clears throat> that's so when you when you when you analyze um all these bottlenecks with filemaker and performance and one of the things hansa does is he talks about using perform script on server and Many of you may know, you know, perform script on server is great, but if if you've got a bunch of scripts that use it and a bunch of users all the time, when this script uh, engine on the server goes down, everyone's hosed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about 18, but 14, 15, 16, they really struggled with that. So we found that whenever we rely, we couldn't rely too heavily on perform script on server. And we use it in some places. So sometimes we use perform script on server and it's really fast. Um, sometimes we, we have to wait for the data to get back and sometimes we don't. Something that we have done that I wish we had the ability to do is to do more using straight data API. We have some things where it, when it's in dev mode, we'll run a script and at the end, we, we log it via the data API. So it's not using it's not using anything except the data API. And that is super, super fast. It's kind of funny you mentioned that we just had a couple solutions that were going across the land, like server to server communication, writing data back and forth and doing some reformatting things. And we did it FileMaker to FileMaker first um, and had some performance issues and then switched it to the data API and it's just like, send it, it's done. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. <clears throat> Some people at Beeswax are looking into something where um, a client will open a file and the first thing that happens is a local copy of the file comes out and they work with a local copy with data. And every time they hit save, it just writes the data back via the data API. And that's how they work during the day. And the next day, they open another local file and they just repeat the same thing over. So, I mean, they're, they're, I, uh, saw a presentation by Vince and they were kind of playing around with that. I don't think they've implemented it yet. Maybe they have because it was probably over a year ago. But um, I mean, when we do web stuff, it sounds like some of you are doing web-based things. The data API, you know, it's so nice. It's so non-filemaker. It's like, even though the data, the data you can't, you, I wish you could, I wish you could um, send an array of records to create, not one at a time. But, but the data API is pretty nice because it's, on a non file maker ish. Uh, any other questions about this um, before I, I'll move on a little bit to the party model and talk about that for a minute? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, <clears throat> let me see, what did I have here? Full disclosure, I wanted, I wanted another 90 minutes or so to prepare for this, and we had a couple fires in the last couple days, and I wasn't able to. But um, but I'm gonna do my best to get through some of this. So that's one example of what the party model looks like. 
and that's a relationship. But let me go back to here. So earlier, before we got started, we talked about the fact that the, the party model is basically, it's a way of modeling data so that you have, instead of having a person table and an organization table and a this and an airline table and a and a client's table and a supplier's table and a vendor's table, everyone is a party. And it 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 um it allows you to keep certain a lot of data that's the same for everyone in one place. It's sort of that source of truth. There's only one place to go to find out someone's name. It's not anywhere else. And that would be in the party record. And this, this is the simplest example of the party record, the party model is that usually you have an organization hanging off and a person hanging off, but an organization and a person, they might have different, they would have different types of data that you would keep about them. Some of it would be the same, but if it's the same across everything, you'd put it in the party table. And if it's not, you'd put it in another table. For example, um, another table that you would hang off would be maybe an employee table. Certain things like the start date and the salary or a comp plan, you wouldn't you wouldn't have to store that in the person table. So what you end up with you end up with more tables, but these really um, narrow tables. And I think um, most evidence is that narrow tables are are easier to maintain. They're faster to index and, and search and all that. So when we found out this project had all these. They'd always talk about, oh, a shipper and a consignee and a field ops person and a courier and, a, and, a, and an accounts. They, they had all these entities. And I thought, oh, perfect, party model. So we implemented the party model here. And it's something that it's, you, there's not one way to do it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, and I did a lot of reading and just came up with what I thought was worked the best for the solution. If we did a project next month, we started a project and we were gonna do the party model, I don't know if we would do it exactly the same way. Um, but um, but uh, let me, talking about the relationships will help and then I'm gonna, I'll dive back into the system and show you how it works in the real world. Um, some people that use the party model, they actually don't, um, they may not use two records here for a relationship. They might have one. Sometimes they don't have a role. They store the role in, the, in this table. And someone once said to me, if you don't start with the party, if you don't start with this, this, if you don't start here, you're gonna end up here anyway. And so that's why we implemented it this way. So, and I'm gonna, oh, here's an example. So. One, uh, here's a, here's a uh, party relationship. You've got Acme Inc., which is an organization. Mm -hmm. The role is employer. And then there's a, two records in here for the relationship. One is... Um, so my, one, real, real quick, do you want to point to the, with the cursor? So oh, the sure, sure. Pick it up too. <laughs> I forgot, sorry. So, ooh, you can't, I can't, this is the... Oh, it's not. Yeah, that's record. all right. So, um, so you've got the party relationship and then, and then, you notice to the right, um, sometimes once you get further down, you might call that, that's the reciprocal party role and there's reciprocal party. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm actually gonna jump right in and show you that. But Lee, Leah and Acme are both parties, right? Just one is a person type and one is an organization type. So let's jump back into um, this solution and get out of this. And I'm going to go to um, I'm going to go to an organization, and um, so we have this organization, and we have these these uh, these six contacts here that are related. So the the T I'm on a table called organization, and this relationship is is party relation. Everyone see that? And I'm on organization. Okay. So let's go look and see what that looks like in the in here. So I've got trying to get this so I can zoom in and it be. So organization is actually tied to party. 
There it is. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between an organization and a, um, and a party, just like there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a person and a party. Um, I use a lot of Boolean flags just to keep myself straight because I was sort of learning this and teaching myself as I went. And this is what a lot of people do is there's this is organization, is group, is employee, is dev. What I realized after I was doing this for a while is I didn't always need those, but there was, it was sort of a nice mental check. So you'll notice um, almost every table I have has a, has a bool constant in there for, for, for true. So the reason um, you would have them and saying you're not needing them is if you're looking at an organization and you want to see the related organization specific data from that separate table, you would, you would know that you're looking for organization data and you would just look through the relationship and either there's something right. there or there's not. Yeah. yeah. And you also, when I, early on when I was showing that get parties, those flags is organization. That was one of those, that was one of those things because I can search across, I, I have one table to search across every entity, every person, every organization, every airline, every hotel. I only have one place to go and look, um, but then I can constrain it by that flag. So, because organization is a one-to-one -one relationship with party, I get the benefit of everything tied to that party record, everything tied to that organization's party record I have access to. So the relationship on that, on that layout was, um, it was party relation, right? I think it was party relation, yeah. yeah. So I go party, notice this, Notice this party, party role, party relation, party. Is this, hopefully this looks a little bit like, a little bit like this. Um, so I have a role to go into the party. Then I have, then I have, um, I have two records in the party relationship. One is for the ID party from, and one is for the ID party to. And I'll show you that, um, I'll show you even a better example of that in a minute. We also set a flag for whether or not it's current because you know we want to track the history of someone. You might be an employee of 360 Works, but you weren't two years ago, and you may not be in five years, but you are right now. Um, so, so, um, so we keep track of those relationships in perpetuity, it's just that whether or not it's current is, is why it's showing. And then, um, and then there's the party to to the party from, and then, then we have the, um, then goes to the reciprocal party role and then all the way back to the party. So for the, for performance reasons, I, I store the names of things in this party relation table so that I don't have to show data four or five hops away in a portal. What I learned was I could show that information, but if we have, but if it's over WAN and some of these organizations have 300 people and I want to do a search, I mean, it just that you can see that scrolling happen when you're, when you're doing uh, WAN, WAN testing. So whenever we do these transactions, whenever we can, we very often um, will write to kind of a cached value because we know we can update it in our transaction so that's why we have this see we have this party to name and party to role um, I'm gonna go ahead and add someone to this so I'm gonna add a contact um, notice it says create party I'm going to create a party I just happen to be on a on a slide panel for a person but I'm still going to create a party record. So I'm, right now I'm just going to look for someone. I'm going to look for Marty Thomason. Next. And what this does is allow me to look to see if there are any other, if Marty's already in there. And it turns out that's the guy I'm looking for. So instead of, I could say no matches and I could continue and fill out all his information. It would create the record and it would tie them to here. But I'm going to go back and just use this, use, I'm just going to go back and use Marty because I want, that's the Marty I'm looking for and I want to add him to this organization. So when I click add, so Marty is with this organization and I clicked on his detail and when I go look at him now, 
I see that I'm looking at the same relationship. So in this case, I'm on the pers I'm on a person uh, record because I have some things that are that are in the person table. I could I could easily be on the party uh, on a on a party table occurrence too, but there are more fields related to a person than the party, so I'm on person, but I'm still using the exact same relationship, party relation, even though it's a different table occurrence because they all go through party. So what's the advantage of doing this? Uh, is it if you're going to have parties which can be more than one kind of thing at a time? Yeah. Um, is that the primary benefit? That's, like a person that could be a vendor and a customer? That's that's the main one. Mm -hmm. and, and same for organizations. So for example, so Marty has the role of a contact and that's really just a preliminary default role for this. He's also has the role of MIL employee, which means something to the system. If he has that role, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that can happen. For example, if he didn't have that role, you, you wouldn't see any of this. You wouldn't be able to log in. There's all kinds of things that happen with that role. If I go to back to that organization, so this organization has uh, the role of MIL office, which means something. It's not an agent in airline. Let me, let me look for um, Air France. So, so if, when I go to Air France, Air France um, has the role of an airline. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back and um, see. I guess another advantage is you can search across all of these things in one shot. That's right. You don't have to do like an airline search or an organization That's search right. or a employee search. It's just yeah. search. It's search. Search yeah. You can constrain it if you want to, but you're you're wide open. So. <laughs> See this tab, it's grayed out. And if I click here, it says this company does not have the role of airline. I know that's a little verbose, but um, that's just me making sure I'm doing what I need to be doing. So I can't click on this tab. If it's grayed out, but I can't click on it even if I wanted to. And I'm going to go back to... Um, uh, so how many people wish that when I came back to this window, my last search criteria was still in the box. Nice. Would you, would, no, yes, no? Yes. yes, I guess it depends on what people are doing. I'm just curious because we, we left the values there. We started with nothing, but if they went back, the idea is that um, you know maybe they misspelled something and they want that criteria there. And they came back really hard and said, we want it cleared out every single time. Now some people in the company, didn't want that, but the president of the company did, and so that's who. Wanted. <laughs> so I was just curious I, if I it bothered anyone. I think there's different use cases. Like yeah, if you're are. searching for airlines or a specific group of airlines, and you get ten things back, and you're going to want to pick one, see it, pick the second one, see it, pick the third one, see it. Yeah. Then you don't want to leave it there. <clears throat> but if it's just like searching and find something, yeah. the next time you go back, you're searching you for clear. something totally yeah. different. Yeah. Now, I mean, no. When you Google, it, it remembers your. It keeps your last query. Sure does. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you for that. So I'm going to load Air France. So Air France has the role of airline. When I select a role, um, it it does a transaction. It creates a role record, which, depending on what role it is, does some things. So, for example, when when we when someone added Air France and then they said Air France has the role of airline, it created a bunch of records because airlines have all this, it's, it's pretty involved, but um, it, now I can do this. So all of a sudden, all this information that, you know, we, so this is a great example of, there's a ton of information that they hold about an airline and information about that particular airport. So there's Air France JFK, but in the production system, there's Air France in, you know, 12 cities. So they have some information that's, are relevant for for the JFK uh, for Air France JFK and then they have some information that's relevant for Air France the airline so um, this airline record is shared across all the Air France's you'll notice that if I was creating this from scratch I can say assign airline and it'll pull up all the airlines and you can add it so um, uh, what was I so so anyway oh you wouldn't want to create all these fields to hold all this data about Air France 
in the organization table when you know two percent of the organizations are going to need it this is another example of why you have these separate thin tables for storing just the data that needs to be there um, so does this solution have a lot of entities or parties that fall in more than one category they do they do um, and it's not so much so in the in the party model there's something called the declarative role like for example you're an employee of 360 works that's a declarative role that's sort of that's that's what you are in with regard to 360 works but you know um, uh, you're you know you're a writer right now and you might you might be a developer on a project and you might be the project manager on another project and you might be the QA person on a third project those are what's called what what Len Silverstone says is our contextual roles just in the context of a project you might play the role of a developer or the role of QA but a declarative role is an employee because across all those things you're always an employee of 360 works does that make sense so in that respect when it comes to contextual roles that's where this really kicks in so when I was on when I'm on these um, shipments and I'm looking for let's see I think I might be the do I have yeah so when I'm on a shipment the Met on this shipment the Met has the role of a shipper on another shipment they might have the role of the consignee or the agent they also might have the role of the lender for content so when I, a lot of overlap there. Yeah, there, yeah, there is a lot of different roles. So when I go to the Mets record and I go to activity, this is probably one of the ways that shows this off the most is I go here and I, all I'm doing is I'm looking, one thing we didn't talk about and I won't, we don't have time, is um, we also track, the, there's the idea of an activity role. So you have the role of an employee, but Tomorrow on the field trip, you're going to have the role of a driver, but that's a contextual role. So this is looking at the activity role for their party. And this is, these are the roles they played on all these different shipments. And think about that from a reporting perspective. I can go and see the whole history and I can, we can, we'll get into more reporting where we can add filters to this. I just want to see where, where they were the shipper on an export, or maybe they were the consignee on an import. And the same is true across any organization and any person. So I can go to a person and I can say, oh, they were the courier on this shipment. They were the, they were the driver on this shipment. They were the... So that is where the party model, I mean, it's probably sounds maybe a little bit complicated, but that's, I think that's where the benefits of the party model come in for more robust, complicated systems with lots of entities, lots of roles, lots of, um, uh, moving parts. I mean, this is a fine art logistics company where they have all these shipments and there's so many things that happen on one shipment. It just made sense to try to do this party model. Yes, sir. How often have you found yourself using the party model in the databases that you've worked on? This is the first, we've, we've used small pieces of it for the last maybe three years, but this is the first time that we implemented it full bore. Um, I'm sure we'll do it again, but we probably wouldn't do it unless it was a project of some significant size because there's a lot of sort of thought and work to go into it. I mean, it's just like anything else, you know, um, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. We get huge benefits, but it was a lot of work to set up and get right. And, um, and so, um, I mean, I think... 10 years ago, I would have said, I'm gonna use it all the time, but I'm, I'm older and wiser now. I wouldn't use it all the time. I would use it when it, when it calls for it, and I'd think hard about it. <laughs> but in this case, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, worked out, um, it's worked out pretty well. As a matter of, when I think about these three buckets, you know, MVC and transactions and party model, the party model is the only thing that doesn't have a lot of drawbacks. It's a lot of work to implement, but, but there are a lot of benefits. Um, the MVC thing, using the three different files, I love that everything is separated in its own place. I love that at first it's a real pain in the rear to have a script that says create shipment in the UI file. And then you gather a bunch of data and you pass it to a script that says create shipment. But that script does something totally different. It does a lot more work 
and it's a lot longer. Um, at first, that can be frustrating because you feel like you're duplicating work. You thought, why don't I just do this once? But if you stick with it, you realize there are benefits because the script I write in the API file, I might use five times or six times um, from, for different things. Um, but it's not necessary, especially on a smaller project. Um, this is the first time I was able to embrace the, the whole s separation model for FileMaker because it never appealed to me. And this is kind of like it, but I don't think of it like the separation model of someone explained to me 15 years ago. I think of it as Laravel or something, you know, even though it's not, I wish it was. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so we, we took on a lot of things that we hadn't done before on this project. And in the end, the result was great, but we really had to, um, we really had to pivot on a couple things. Some of it was around performance and some of it was, um, well, most of it was around performance. Um, yeah, um, I think, let me see. I don't know that I have too much more to go through. Uh, <coughs> here are, <clears throat> here are some things, um, and I can, I can share these, um, with David or via email, but there's a, um, there is a very simple video that Todd Geist did about the separation model, just explains the basics of it. Um, in case you're interested, he just talks through the fastest way to create a, you know, duplicate a file, change your file references. All of a sudden you have separation model and he talks about the pros and cons of that. Um, there's a link for carbon that I can share. Um, there is a lot of really good stuff in there, but you know, it would take time to go through, but, um, I'm sure that some of that we'll, we'll use in most any projects that are of, of significant size. The proof group, um, who I mentioned earlier, they did a, you know, that dig FM, you know, that, that, um, you know, what I'm talking about that in, in familiar. dig FM, I think it's the thing that FileMaker puts on and, and at, at the wedge, it's sort of like this group only FileMaker does it and they have different people come and do presentations, sometimes in person, sometimes remote. Uh, Ernest Co and Cornwalker, both co-founders of proof group did a really cool thing on the party model and how they implement it and why they implement it. So I learned a lot from that and I learned a lot from just uh, bending Ernest's ear. And then also, um, oh, I, let's see, data model plan. I may, have, I may not have finished. Oh, I see I have the same link in there twice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can fix that later, but I'll also tell you, does anyone know who Dave Graham is? He used to have his own business in San Diego, and now he works uh, for Geist Interactive. And he did a session two years ago at DevCon. You can watch on YouTube, but it's, um, it's a great video on, on the party model. And it explains it much better than I could in a much more simple fashion. He has some real world examples, but he explains how and why it works and why it's so elegant. And he does a good job of explaining it. I watched that video more than once uh, before I uh, kind of could figure out what I was doing. Um, and I think it's probably... I have a question on the yes. separation model. How do you manage the permissions on that? Setting up users and things, is external Good question. the best way to do it? It absolutely is, yeah. So when we were first um, doing this in, in-house and we were doing some internal testing, you know, we just, we had a handful of people that had accounts and I just needed to make sure they were maintained in the three systems. But thankfully the client, and I mean, I, I would love it if every client had Active Directory. Mm -hmm. They had AD and so we just had to set up groups and we were done. It was super easy to implement. Have you had a good solution for that if they don't have that? I've, I've no, found that to be really at difficult. least, yeah. at, least <laughs> at least it's, at least it's three files and not 29. <laughs> Cause that, you know, that's, that's a pain. I, who's, is it? There's, a, there's some other client we have that has lots of files and they, they won't yeah. pay yeah, for we it. Yeah, they've got like 50 files and they're like, can we give us access? And it's yeah. like, no. Yeah. It's like, it's just, it's going to take hours. <laughs> we have another client um, that the CEO of the company, uh, he has credentials because he likes to get in there and just play around with things. I mean, he'll go and he'll go and figure out what the primary key is of some invoice that he thinks is broken and he'll copy and paste it or he'll remove it or 
and he's the CEO, and he doesn't really know what he's doing, but he'll go in there and change some things around. And about half the company, because it's so hard for them to add people to the system and deal with credentials, most everyone knows his, his login, his login wow. and it's full access. <laughs> yeah, AD is great. This company on that side, on that front, they are super strict about all that stuff, and they're all kind of Microsoft gurus and experts. So that was really easy to implement. We've seen that same thing with clients that we go to them. They're using multiple files for things, and people just end up all logging with the same username and password because it's too difficult to handle employees coming and going or just getting a fax or something. Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, AD is great. Yeah. Yeah. Don't we, um, is, is Marcos, are they on AD yet? Or are they going right, that way? They're going they're, they're right. Yeah. Sanjeev does a lot of um, networking, server side stuff, implementing things like migrating to different email platforms, setting up Active Directory. I'm sure Active, you mean that's something everyone wants to do there? Are there, yeah. is there any um, pushback? No pushback that's anymore. Good. <clears throat> I love Active Directory too. It's just a simple. Book. I know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, yeah. If they don't, if they don't have it, <laughs> yeah. then there's nothing you can do about it. <clears throat> um, w w uh, another nice thing about the separation model is, um, and and MVC is when we do data migrations. That's super simple. The UI file has nothing in it except for um, we have a log. A, we we have a change log that's baked into the 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 solution. And that's the only data that's in the UI file. So as a matter of fact, I can show you that really quickly. It's a nice way to keep track of things. So, so I don't know if you can see down in the corner, it says the build and the date. And um, so when we do it, we'll, we'll, we'll do a bunch of work and development and we'll push a version up to their dev server. And when everything's blessed and they approve everything, we take their data file and just do a data migration, you know, use the data migration tool from their production to a clone of our database. And then the API file and the, uh, and the UI file, we just pull up there. So that's also really nice. The only thing that stays in this file is this. So this is ever since the beginning, the first release was 0.5 alpha um, back in, let's see, November of 2018. And then, um, I, I, I know it's small. I don't know if you all can see that, but we just, we just, we just have a running update of stuff that we do and keep track of. I mean, everyone's got different bug systems. We actually use something else for project management, but this is just a way for me to keep up with what I've done. And it's also it. It turns out that the users really like it, even if they don't understand everything they see. It makes them feel good that they can see that certain things are done and they might look through here and and just to validate that something was done and when it was done so and you have to you're manually putting all those yes in, yep and then we even have a you know so this particular feature it's already been deployed to production we did a hot fix and deployed it already even though they don't have it and um and that's so that's for them and then the the back end for that is <clears throat> is is here so this is the latest current version that i'm working on and then um this 1.1.1 is on their dev environment and if i keep on going back 1.0.9 is in their production environment so that's so it's been um it's been a nice tool i mean of course you have to keep up with it but um it's been a simple and nice tool to uh, do that and then if it's a bug or in production you know i have these little flags that do things uh, that's just a little thing that we try to do on our projects and it turns out is that clients really seem to like it what are some of the new features you're envisioning for 2.0 anything sexy 2.0 <laughs> you mean for this we're 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 a long way from 2.0 as of right now um there will be some reporting. There'll be a lot more um, integration, and we're building a web app, which that'll be really cool. But it won't affect this. It'll be a web front end for other for other for people in their field ops to be able to log in and do stuff too. But we do, you know, there's some lightweight reporting. This is that's looking at test data, so that's not great because there's not much in there. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, we have cool little things like this where you can compare what's going on in the different offices, nice. their exports, imports versus their estimates. Um, and you know, that, that's something we'll do more of. Those are, that's some, you know, JavaScript. So emphasis on reporting. Um, yeah, it'll be more reporting. Yeah, we, one of the things we implemented recently, again, this is a bunch of test data, so there's probably not much, yeah, there's nothing on here. Um, so to recap, since you did this project with the three different models, yep. what would you describe as the time frame of which was the easiest to develop versus the most difficult, and then time-wise, how would you rank the extra effort with the model that you chose to go with? Uh, okay, so if we're talking about these three things, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so <clears throat> so for NVC, I, that was, um, it wasn't too big of an investment. It was, it's more about, it's more about um, holding yourself to keep up with it because it's really easy to say, you know what, I'm just going to do this in one file or I'm just going to, you know what, I'm just going to do the script at one place because I don't want to do it someplace else. So there's a there's an element of discipline before you reach a threshold where you realize oh there is a lot of benefit to this but it you got to get there um, so and also for a bigger solution it's there's more benefit the party model that's that's easy to say if it's a larger solution and they have a lot of entities table entities and roles and things where an organization or a person might where, where where you are tracking the different things they're doing party model is great but um there are lots of data models out there party model is just one of them and there are about a million ways to implement the party model so it's a big undertaking that i wouldn't do for just any project um i will say about transactions trans true transactions in filemaker are great but what we found is it doesn't really matter if the whole thing commits or not if they're creating a shipment record. I mean, it's not like it's, you know, a transaction is usually something that you do around invoicing. You know, you don't want to, if you have line items, you don't want to send two line items and the third one not make it. So that's when you really use transactions, which FileMaker does natively as long as you do it. Um, the transactions piece for this in that, in that API file just logging the transaction and not having it transactional, that's, that's really big. When we first rolled this out to the beta users and whenever they had problems or something wasn't working, they said, yeah, I'm searching for this company and it's, it's not there. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I went to that API file and like, yeah, because you searched for the net 14 times, N-E-T. <laughs> I could tell them that. Someone would say, oh, so-and-so in San Francisco, she said that she had a shipment and we still haven't gotten a code back from the parent system. And I go in there and it's like, no, she, she never did that. Or, yeah, she did that for, you know, she did that for X company, but not for Y company, like she told you, she said. I mean, everything they did is logged in there. Um, so that, that was a huge benefit. Troubleshooting for me, for us, was one thing, but knowing what they did all, every time. I mean, because you know, a lot of people just aren't very honest about it. I mean, people would say, oh, this took 45 seconds. And we went in there and said, it took three seconds. We know it took three seconds, because I don't know if you all know, but there was a there was a timer mm -hmm. in there. So there were a lot of benefits to, to that. To that. Um, yeah, it'd have to be a big project to do all of this again. But you know, we, we will do projects this size, but I don't I don't right now I don't think we have any projects that are this scale. I hope that answered that question. Well it sounds like you can combine some of the info too, like the contact interaction to be party like incorporating it with another model, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um there's something that, that a lot of people um when a lot of people talk about the party model, they talk about um, contacts mm -hmm. and the contact method and Dave Graham in one of those videos does a good job of explaining this but if I go to an organization um, so I'm gonna so this opens up a card and I've got multiple areas to um, I can have one or more addresses one or more phone numbers and one or more 
uh, it says internet, e you know, LinkedIn, email, anything like that. Mm -hmm. But, and this is a card window, so I'm gonna have to go to this layout, right? That's one thing that I, I still can't get quite used to. If you're in a card window, you can't, you can't go into layout mode. You gotta get out of the card and go, um, let's see, and that's, let me just open up that real quick, because this is probably more short. So here's this contact method. Mm -hmm. So notice the it's contact method, contact method, contact method. Um, the contact method is oh, where is it? So here's the contact method table. And the contact method just has it's sort of a super type. It it the phones and internet addresses and physical addresses are all in separate tables. The contact method just drives them. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the contact method and a phone record or the contact method ID and the physical address ID. So, um, and he does a good job of explaining why that's a benefit. For example, I might have a bunch of different contact methods, but maybe I wanna have labels to them or maybe I wanna say, well, this person, this person only wants to be contacted via phone between you know eight and five Monday through Friday. So that information he would put in the contact method. So um, this is I wanted to you list all the stuff together in one exactly in yes one yeah you can. So here it's separate for input and just for visibility, but I can but they're all stored together so if I so this is just filtered by I'm sure it says something like is address yeah so is address so when I um, when I go to add an address also uh, it's worth mentioning another technique that we do a lot of and I think more and more people are doing is when I do this and I go in here and I start typing information you know um, and I do this um, you know, most people would assume that it's committing a record, and it is, but it's committing a record in a global utility table in the UI file. The UI file, I have several utility tables that are used to store data temporarily. So when people want to edit a record, they can do whatever they want all day long. And if they want to change their mind, they hit cancel. If they want to hit save, we package it all up and we throw it to the API file. Um, and that's really nice because it's, it's a pain when people make a mistake and they at least they get one more chance to do it. So we all often have this <laughs> cancel and save and all that kind of stuff. We don't do it for everything, but we do it for things that require separate fields. Um, another nice thing about this is the company had a big problem with people, everyone being able to edit records and like notes fields. And people would type whatever and no one knew who did it. No one knew when they did it. Um, and they really like the ability to, for everyone to know what's happening. Let me get, I'll give you a, a good example of, is this, so for an organization, see this notes legacy field? Um, they had one field and there's all kinds of stuff that would get put in there. I mean, some stuff that was bad. <laughs> um, and over time, remember the system is super old. So you, you see, you'd see a note in there from 2002 and then a note from 2011. So, um, they can add their notes under preferences <coughs> or here. So he, now when they add a note, they can add a note, they can give it a, a type, they can say something and save it. So that note just got saved. It's a booking note, Michael added it on this date and I can delete it and when I edit it, um, I can go back here and do this and change the note um, and then even commit that record. But if I hit cancel, nothing happens because every time I go grab something from the data, I throw it in the utility table and globals. And then only upon save do we commit it. I mean, I, I guess that's pretty common, right? Or I don't, you all do that sort of thing? I have a lot of solutions to the ground up. At least not ones large enough to warrant all this okay. consideration. So that's pretty cool. So, um, so if I go to the API file, I'm gonna see, so here I got, there's where I, um, there's where I got a preference note. 
I just passed it the ID and then I got the data back. And then before that, I created a pref note. There's the data. There's the, um, that's me getting that shipment report. When I ran that report and it threw up that web viewer, um, I just called a script called get off a shipment report. And then I do a bunch of stuff and then put together um, this uh, JSON. So. It almost feels like we're working in a browser as opposed to in FileMaker, the way the modeling and stuff works. It's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you know what? I, mean, I This is something I actually meant to show earlier and I didn't, but I'll just point out that when I added <clears throat> Marty to that company, that is, that's, see that create party relationship and I passed it data. So there's the, there's obviously, I just, I made an object called party from. That was the from, that was the two. So this is two distinct uh, parties. I wanted to create a relationship. And so this is actually a true transaction. So it's worth looking at this <laughs> script. So you can see what I passed in. After her 8.30 announcement, we gotta All right. get wrapped up here. So, so um, I get the party to ID and the party from ID, and this is just to make sure that um, I don't already have a relationship between those two people for that, for that one thing. And then if I do, I air out this party relation record already exists. Otherwise, I create the relation record. So here's my from to the to. So I set a transaction um, ID party relation to blank, which is the primary key of that party relation table. Um, I set a flag to one, a bool, and then I set my from, you know, I set all these fields to the from, and then I do the exact, and then I, um, I do the reverse. I set the two, and that's when I create both those, those, two, um, those two records that are just, they're pointing to um, both sides of the party. And then is current, start date, and also when I delete it, I go and write the end date out. So I change the one to a zero, it's, the, it's current is false, and then we have an end date for whenever they left the company or what have you. Um, and that, so that's, that's a pretty simple example of, um, of me creating that relationship, and this is in, true in the transaction style where I just set a bunch of keys and then, and then once you do these last things, you save the transaction and end the transaction. And that's not me, that's Carbon. Um, that's, what, that's what does all the magic and commits the records and all of a sudden everything just pops into place. Okay, so I will stop talking. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Arthur. Thanks. So did you end this or am I? Should I? Uh, maybe you can hit the hang up button on there. All right. Very impressive. Huh? Maybe a recording going. Oh, yeah. How long did I?